What's up, boss? This is Abraham's wallet. We span the gap between the austerity of obedience to God and the prosperity rising from faithfulness. Run your home and your dough like a biblical boss. Here we are, back as ever. Mark, how do you... We're not recording this in Lodo Feb, but how how do you bet Lodo Feb is going for your family? Um, I think it's going well, but I do have to say, a listener who is not just a listener, there's somebody that has deep uh, personal there's connection. To so much family. more than a listener. Yeah, it's somebody that that I really have affection for. Yeah. You know who you are. Uh, <laughs> texted me yesterday and uh-huh. said... Because they were listening to the, what's the episode that just came out? Um, Tactics. Lo- the Lodo Feb prep episode. Yes, yes. And he said, just so you know, uh, I, I don't know if they felt this. I received that they were disappointed, that they oh. were let down by oh. Abraham's wallet. Um, and they said, it just feels like stocking your freezer in January completely <laughs> ruins the whole point of Lodo Feb. I... I understand that. Sentiment. And I wrote back and I said, I agree. Um, my sister asked me last night because we had planned to go on a double date with her and her husband. Um, and we were going to go to Top Golf together because they've never been. And she's like, but wait a second, you're going to do that February thing, aren't you? And I said, well, we could go get some gift cards right now to Top Golf. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought of this wonderful listener who, uh, was like He's sitting there shaking, shaking their head at me. And I thought, yeah. oh, maybe I can't do that. So Yeah, right. So yeah, um, I I think that the family probably is um, giving it their all at this stage of, of Lodo Feb. I think that, that we have had at least two nights where I awoke um, between the hours of 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. with a stomach ache because I ate too much lentils. <laughs> um, and lentils don't sit well with me late at night. Uh huh. Um, what else do I think probably happened? I think that <laughs> I, I think that I went to to hang out with one of the elders at a church we've been attending uh, at least twice so far because mm-hmm. he has invited me on Wednesdays to come to his office where there is a full lunch catered uh, <laughs> for anybody who walks through the door. Um, and like, if the food was good the first time, you're like, man, when can we do this again? This was really good spending time with you. Yes. Uh, and so that's some of the things I think are happening. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Well, How about I, know you? you've, I know that you've got a thing that you're rolling out for us today. Um, but I, I've got something in, while we're killing time here up at the front that I'd like to throw to you and the people because it not only entertains me, it might be useful, at least in the short term. Are you ready for this? Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't know if you've heard, but there is an app that's just been released. I would file this under financial news. Okay. An app has just been re- released called Autopilot. Okay. It is a, it's a bit like a robo-advisor. You hand it some money and it will put your money in the appropriate stocks. But here, here's the catch. You, this machine tracks exactly the investment strategies of famous politicians and goes, here's where Nancy Pelosi, we know that she's putting her money. So you could select the Nancy Pelosi apportionment and it would put your money on all the things that she's passing laws for and putting her money into. And so it's supposed to do two things simultaneously. One is it's supposed to give investors the same kind of leg up that that politicians have because they know what laws are about to be passed. They know what businesses are about to get favored status, what new government contracts. So that's obviously they do this all the time. They shift their money and they leave office gazillionaires. So one is, hey, if these people are, are, are doing this and we can see on the public record what's going on, why don't, we, why don't we benefit from that too? At the same time, 
it's got to be a short amount of time before the kibosh falls down on this. 100%. And I know that, what's that? I said 100%. Yeah. So it's it's also supposed to be shining the the light, like when you turn on the lights and the cockroaches scatter, turning on the light. Hey, everybody, does anybody wonder why these people are making 300% returns in a year? Well, we can prove that they're doing it because we have actual dollars against it. So it's 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 basically trying to track insider information uh, from the outside, which I think is pretty clever. I don't know if the government would then seize all of the funds <laughs> inside of this app, but uh, well, I, Steven, I like the idea from a from a I don't know a justicey disruptor kind of a standpoint. You know, this is why I'm a proponent of what they call weak efficient market hypothesis. Oh, weak efficient, efficient market hypothesis. Efficient market hypothesis basically says that all the information about a stock that would contribute to its price going up or down uh, is already baked into the stock. Right. And there's what's called strong and weak versions of this. Okay. The, the weak version says all public information about a stock is already baked into the price, meaning right. we we just assume that the, the institutional money managers and the, the world has come through all the data provided by companies, uh, all their announcements, etc., and has already collectively priced via the market those data into whatever the stock price is trading at. And the stock price moves as new data becomes available. Right. Strong efficient market hypothesis says that not only all the public information, but also all of the non-public information is also priced into the stock because there's no way that there's not a contingent of people who are trading based on that non-public info. We know that's true because we've seen Nancy Pelosi's wealth grow. We know that's true uh, because we've seen that um, certain insiders at companies regularly uh, sell a bunch of shares and then right. news comes out and you go, oh, I guess I know why they were selling those shares. Um, so depending on where you sit on this strong versus weak efficient markets hypothesis, you might think that this app is going to be successful or not. But if, if you were a strong markets proponent, meaning you think that all the insider info is already baked into the price of these stocks, mm -hmm. um, then you might say Pelosi is doing something a bit more nefarious, like, um, like the info is already just in her head and she is trading and then passing the law versus um, kind of going another way around. So there, there's a few ways to think of that, but uh, my, my caution to people thinking about using this app would be more if by the time that uh, anybody's trading strategy, but let's just use, keep using Nancy as the example, by the time that, that gets published, uh, these aren't the only people who are interested in looking through that data and processing it. Uh, so that that strategy has probably already been out there for, for quite a while. Um, so I'll be interested to see how it goes, though. Yeah, it is interesting. It's certainly been out there long enough to to pass all of the Apple App Store inspections and finally make it through. And I'm sure that the Apple crawler reader is listening to our words right now and making note. Ah, oh, this many more people know about this now. Though. Maybe the oh. Apple crawler is actually located in Lithuania. And that is why we have Lithuanian listeners everywhere. Oh. <laughs> Maybe so as discussed earlier. Yeah. Um, okay. Before we get to your thing, I have to share something that is, it's nakedly self-serving on one nakedly. Way. On one side, if you want to think of me that way, I wish you wouldn't. Naked? It's nakedly self-serving. Oh, I no... thought if we wanted to think of you naked, we were about to... No, 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 don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, but if you want to just think of it as I'm talking with a friend and a group of friends here, and I want to share something about my life, then I'm going to do that, which is, as the, as the longtime listener knows, I have... 
it's not even a side hustle. There's no hustling involved. It's just a little hobby that I have, which is recording songs. And, um, I've got, I got some new mixes that, that, uh, me and my good friend, Aaron Hunt put together this morning and I'm so excited about them. Would you like to hear one of them? And then we can, can I, can I do a live on air listen party? I, I wish you would. Well, okay. why don't we, I'll pick a song here. Um, I, 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 we'll start playing it and then, I don't know, we, we get, might listen to a, a verse and a chorus and then you, you respond. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, here we go. Say a few things. I think okay. it's got some U2 uh, groove to it. I feel like mm. um, there was a there was a pick scratch, which I really I think is something we've lost from modern rock music. Yeah, that's right. Um, and yeah, it's a cool song. Good. Did you spend a lot of time on that, or did you just kind of lay it down all at once? <laughs> we've spent so much time. We've poured over every single part of it far too much it's taken a very long time to do it sounds great good i I didn't mean did you just come up with it on the fly as much as i wondered if um this is the type of thing you get a band together and just play it and record it or do are you recording every single little piece and layering it and all that if anybody's interested we we had an ambition that it would feel like a a tight three-piece <clears throat> and and that we wanted we actually tried this to put mics in a room and put a bass guitar and drums together and played it live and i was in a booth singing and playing the acoustic guitar and um it didn't work so <laughs> we yeah we've redone everything in bits and pieces it's been exhausting was that joss sir camp on the drums no it wasn't but it was it was aaron who does everything and he, I actually did the demo with my old good friend, uh, Josh Surkamp, and uh, we used the demo very closely on this recording. And, and this is Aaron doing his best Josh Surkamp impression. Got so it. He's, he's playing exactly the parts that Josh played. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, if you, need a, if you need a drummer, I'm just saying. <laughs> You're I'm there. I'm here. I've got like seven beats these days in my repertoire. Man, so. that's amazing. So, you know, <laughs> that's maybe great. Someday. That's uh, good to know, buddy. Well, nice work. Where can people find this music? Is it going to be on Spotify soon? Yes. Yeah, soon. Well, soon ish, because <clears throat> we've got part of the, we got a group of about seven songs we're doing. I think we've got four of them mixed. Then we're going to do three more. And then eventually they'll get all shot out into the universe on all of the platforms. And, the people will know about it now. What what you've been cooking up in the lab over there, the mm-hmm. a- Abe's financial lab, is is something delightful that's going to please the people for years to come. 
And, and today you're going to give us an overview of what it is that you're going to be rolling out over the next few weeks for us. Would you, would you help me and by extension, the people to get, catch a vision of what it is you're about to do for them? Yeah, I'm kind of, my goal here, have you ever been to uh, one of these super fancy restaurants where there's no. like a prefixed menu and yes. they, they tell you there's going to be four courses or yes. eight courses and then, and then before the meal starts, they come out and they say, the chef has prepared something special before we begin. And they yes. offer you a little bite of something and it gets you really fired up for the meal. Yes. Um, that's my goal is that this is just going to be an hors d'oeuvre, if you will. Okay. Meant to whet the appetite for what I'm calling critical money skills. The idea came to me as for the fourth time I was going through your critical skills class um, and I was hoping you might give us a 30 second, what is that all about? Because it'll really help me explain why I think okay. coming up with some foundational skills in any area uh, can be really helpful. But just tell us, so you'll do a better job of describing critical skills than, than I will. Sure. Years ago, we started putting our collective heads together. That's me and my friends that are all kind of running the same way in a disciple training environment. We have a thing called Jump School that does that very thing. And the idea was, what could we cram people through so that they would have the tools necessary, not that they would be full-fledged, matured, ap ap Pauline disciples at the end of it, but that they would have the tools that could be built on and understood for the rest of their lives. So one of them, for instance, is, do you really know how to repent? Do you, do you really know how to do that? Has anybody ever walked you through that or just have an assumption about it? Well, do you, we walk people through this training. Then when you understand that, you can build on it. You can expand from it. And everything that God does with your life in the future, you can go, well, that fits into one of these buckets of these, of these critical skills that I have. And that was our goal to kind of lay a foundation for people that they can move forward for the rest of their lives and, and be on their way to being mature, trained, equipped disciples. That's, that's what critical skills was. Yeah. And what I really like about that, that model is for each of these skills, there's a lot of sub skills or some of them aren't, are, it's a mix of skills and things that you need to watch out for, or mm -hmm. sort of, you could call them strategies of the enemy. You could call them strongholds. Um, and for a stronghold, there might be one, uh, I mean, if you've discipled guys ever, you've heard guys talk about lust and it's just a stronghold. Right. And your class kind of showed, well, actually that one is kind of underneath some of these other things. There's fear and there's anger and um, that um, it's really helpful to, to get your head around the root cause and the, the big right. boys. Right. Um, whether it's something we're opposing or something we're going after. Um, faith is one of those skills. And I'm like, faith, faith is a gift, right? Well, we actually dug way into that and learned that there's faith and there's all these downstream things that come when we start to to press into faith and really get our arms around. Right. By way of example, I want you to I want you to illustrate this financially, where you think your problem is this, but really you've got a bigger problem that's this. And I'll give as as an example of what you're saying. A lot of people say like, I deal with anger. Oh, I've got to, and, and they can kind of deal with anger. They can like confess their sin or whatever. And they've realized, well, anger keeps coming back or produces something else somewhere else. And I can't control this thing. That's because anger is sort of like one of the little capillaries off of this main vein. And the main vein is fear. And fear produces this, these, or these anger outbursts from you because you're you're afraid of there being some consequence you don't like. So you're going to do anything in your power to kind of control and squelch and keep it the way you want. So w what's a financial example of you think that your main thing is this, but it's this? Yeah, I think that that we have a lot of people who call us up and say, "Hey, I I need your help because." 
I I keep not choosing investments wisely, for example. Oh. Um, and they think I my my problem is <laughs> I don't understand these different investment vehicles and I need someone to teach me about the difference in this ETF and that mutual fund and what about crypto and do I need to understand all of these things to be a wise investor? Um, and when we get down to it, we kind of peel the onion back and go, actually, what you don't understand is the principle of multiplication. Right. Um, and that can take all different forms. Like it's like, well, yeah, you've looked and seen this investment grew by this much every year, but you didn't really know why. And you didn't think about what could eat into multiplying money or, how time works in this thing. So there's a lot of components behind multiplication. We're going to talk about those in great detail when we talk about that in an episode. But today we're going to talk about um, just the give you a little definition and a little biblical backing for each of these as our proposal for the things that are most important uh, to get your hands around. And okay, I said to you before we started recording, like, we it's just for some reason recently it's come up a lot people on twitter say things like you know what they need to teach in high school is how to do your taxes not whatever ethereal literature class they're teaching and i would say (laughs) for all their warts historically meaning over the last hundred years uh education has focused more on principles than on specific skills and i know that you know, it would be fine if they taught some of these specific skills, but doing your taxes is not a foundational skill when it comes to money. It is very easy to find someone to do your taxes for a relatively small amount of money. Yeah. Um, but being a good steward of money uh, and knowing the condition of your flocks, if you will, through like wise budgeting and knowing how to save and set aside, those are skills that are very important and are very related to your tax bill. Um, but you you know you could learn how to to fill in your 1040 uh, at tax time and not be really any better with money than before. Right. So what you're about to do for us is basically give us a table of contents of this upcoming course that you're about to put us all through the critical skills of finance. Before we actually get to the the skill by skill exposition, um, we will come up with with a good solid name and stick with it because i called it like critical money skills you said critical skills of finance oh i'm sorry we're gonna have to figure that out i'm not sure what it should be i I, I don't know that i love critical money skills but okay the point is that you're these things that you're gonna lay out you would say if you could get your head around these seven concepts then everything else that has to do with financial management can can fall into one of these categories and you'll be set to build build a a, a, a storehouse of knowledge that would produce multi-generational wealth. I, I believe so. That's what we're setting out to do. Awesome. Before you're you can be excellent at the handling and stewardship and multiplication of money, you need to get some money. Um, mm. so, number one, earning. This is a critical skill. Um, the the verse I chose as kind of the banner verse is actually Genesis 2.15. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Um, so earning generally comes from work. And that is something that I I think if we think about... Think about people that have a bunch of money. We even talked about this a couple of weeks ago in the gambling episode. People that come by money that didn't work for it. Um, that could be that they won a lottery. It could also be that they inherited a bunch of money. Yes. Um, I've been reading a ton of studies, like academic studies in the past couple of weeks about inheritance. And it is true that uh, there is a fundamental difference in happiness and how comfortable with money people feel who earned the money versus those who inherited it, even if they inherited it from a wise patriarch who had plans for their family. If you didn't earn money, the data says that you are not as well equipped 
to deploy it wisely and even feel good about mm. what you're doing with it. So mm. there's some connection between that initial charter that we have from the Lord to work and keep, or that word actually means protect. It's the same word that, that uh, is used when, when an angel is stationed at the entrance of Eden after Adam and Eve get kicked out. Um, the angel's job was to protect the garden. So Adam's job was to work and to protect or keep. Um, and I would argue that we need to have some some pretty strong connection to how we earn and accumulate money and the purpose that we are put on this earth for, which is to take dominion, to multiply a lot of the things we're going to talk about next. I like you men- I like you saying that earning is a skill. Um, there, forgive me for comparing it, but there are things in critical skills, like you said, faith, where people go like, how's that a skill? But um, I think some, I think a lot of people work, they work jobs and they collect paychecks and they don't understand the principle of earning. So that's great. I look forward to it. We'll talk about a lot in this one, but one last thing is we will talk about the fact that once you get this down, it really helps eliminate that mentality of, man, I just, if I, if I knew how to get my hands on some money, then I could do some things. Once you understand earning, um, you're, you're on the track to start going, well, I understand how to go out and get money and then I can move on to the next skills. Um, and the next skills are about how to make it grow and handle it well. Sweet. Number two. Um, I'm using the term budgeting, um, although I think that there's there's a lot of words that you could use to to say this skill is about knowing. You, you know, Proverbs twenty seven twenty three says, "Know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds." And in our current modern era, I'm going to argue that budgeting is the way that whether we are stewarding tens of millions of dollars or you're working for $15 an hour and just graduated from high school. Um, budgeting is the way that we kind of can keep tabs on that. Er- once we've got earning down, what now, how do I know how much is coming in, how much I'm spending and spoiler alert, Americans are really bad at this. Um, and it's not, it's not like the poor dum-dums that are bad at this. There's brilliant, wealthy people who don't know the condition of their flocks, if you'll yes. indulge the metaphor. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this one is is really important. Um, I'm going to read you a second verse on this one, which is Luke 14, uh, 28 and 30, 28 through 30. It says, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Number three, this one is a big one, um, and it's multiplication. So once you've earned money and you've made sure that you're not bleeding it out faster than you're bringing it in, there's going to be some extra. And one of the principles that I think you must figure out is how do I multiply that money? Um, the The passage here is Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. And, you know, there's probably a lot we talk about on this podcast that is related to, there's so many times that money is spoken about in the Bible that I was always just kind of taught growing up. Well, that's a nice spiritual metaphor of how God thinks about things. Right. And, uh, since we started Abraham's wallet, we've always said some of those, yes, they have spiritual implications and they're about how you're supposed to handle money. Yep. So we have a master and he is coming back and he is expecting us to have demonstrated a return. And if we can demonstrate a return with something meaningless, in the case of Matthew 25, that being a few talents of money, which is not much to a rich man uh, like that, then he'll say, now I'm going to put you in charge of cities. 
Um, now I'm going to put you in charge of men's souls. Um, but we, we serve a master who expects returns. Um, and this has, this has a lot of tentacles that go all through, uh, just how we think about money. I think if you understand this to, to go back to that idea of what are the sub subheadings under this one, if you understand compound interest, you can say, well, if I, if I put aside not that much money, I could be done funding my retirement by the time I'm 35 years old. But if I wait, I'm going to have to save way, way, way more. If I start when I'm 45, start saving and maybe I don't get, get that nest egg built up until I'm 65. Um, it's the same thing when we think about choosing investments, you know, fees, if, if I understand this, I really immediately can grasp why it matters that this fund charges one and a half percent fees and this one charges less than a tenth of a percent. So um, I like this, this idea also from Deuteronomy. The law required owners of productive assets to employ them to benefit the community. Um, so a landowner they were supposed to allow neighbors to use their land to help meet their immediate needs. This is, if you remember Jesus walking through the field and scooping up grain as he went, this is kind yep. of where you... Ruth did that too. Yeah. There's gleaners that were responsible for harv- harvesting food for themselves and landowners who were responsible for giving them access to do so. So part of multiplication is the idea that we want to own productive assets that can actually benefit our community, our families. Um, that's the, that's a piece of the biblical picture of what it looks like. We're, you know, the hot button topic these days in the investing world is ESG investing and socially responsible investing. And yeah, as much as I kind of shake my head at that for a whole bunch of reasons, we should probably do a whole episode on ESG. We should. That'd be great. Um, there's still a biblical principle that we are to own assets that don't just make us richer. They also benefit our community. Um, so that's, that's kind of the multiplication side of it. But under this umbrella, we're also talking about knowing how to deal with risk. So we just did the gambling episode and talked about risk quite a bit, but, uh, I'd say under the topic of risk, Ecclesiastes 11, one is, is the headline verse. What does it say, Stephen? Do you know? Oh, Ecclesiastes 11 one says, um, uh, ca- uh, cast your bread upon the waters. Yep. Yeah. For I can't, after I can't do any days, than that. it does say, I mean, I don't know if this is an error, if we finally found an error in the scripture or what it does say, <laughs> um, cast your bread upon the waters for after many days, you will find it again. <laughs> if, if you've ever thrown bread in the water, <laughs> um, kind of dissolves, doesn't it? <laughs> Maybe. Um, now, I heard somebody teach about this one time and like, if you throw bread into the Sea of Galilee, a bunch of fish eat that bread. And then in time, you're going to catch the fish and you are, you're retrieving your bread. I don't know. Huh. It's a thought. Okay. Fine with me. Um, but the, the idea being, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. That's right. And if you put all your eggs in one basket financially, you're likely to go bust. But if you if you separate your your wealth into groups of seven, yes to eight, yes. which is the, uh, Ecclesiastes eleven two, um, then you're very likely to do all right. So that's one and piece of risk. Clearly, the teaching of Luke sixteen is it sixteen nine or nine sixteen? Is it Luke sixteen? Is the talents? Clearly, that teaching is if you want to avoid all risk. You, you don't multiply your money and God is not happy. So we have to get our head around, okay, we've got to be, we want to be shrewd. We want to be smart about it, but we do have to take risks. So that is something you've got to get your head around and go, I'm going to be somebody who can take a smart risk. That's right. You need to be able to take smart risk. You need to understand the things that we'll talk about when we go through this is like the risk adjusted rate of return. Um, risk tolerance versus risk capacity. So those two things are different. One is more of a personality trait and the other is more of a how much 
can you, how much risk can you take? So there's people who feel like I, I just, it doesn't bother me at all to see my investments go up and down. Let's go as risky as possible. But then you go, well, you'll die if you can't take $5,000 a month out of this to fund your life. So you don't have as much capacity as you have tolerance. So yeah. um, we'll talk about that. And then I, I'll also just talk a little bit in this one about the difference in head knowledge and experience. Um, I, I had a meeting today with a client who said, I know that we talked about the risk I was taking and I felt totally fine with that in my head when you said you could lose this much in a year. But then 2022 happened and I didn't like how I felt when I experienced that. So we kind of meet and talk through, well, do we have a mismatch? Do we think we, or, or is this just an education thing? And we'll talk through that when we get to, to risk and multiplication. Great. Okay. Number, Number four. four. This one was a little controversial for you, Stephen. You weren't sure if you liked it as one of the, the skills, but um, I believe that understanding debt is is a really important one. And you could argue that, hey, I, if I understand compound interest, this is kind of the opposite side of that coin. But uh, it's such a part of our society. Um, it's a part of, for most people, how they're going to end up acquiring housing. Um, it is it is also a part of how, you know, we've done whole episodes on what should you do with your emergency fund? And we recommended that people put it in a money market account. So not only are we borrowers often in our world, we are also lenders. Um, and there's verses like Proverbs 22, seven that says the borrower is slave to the lender. Um, and I hear that used a lot of times a young client will come to me and say, my parents told me we should never get a mortgage because of Proverbs 22, seven. Right. And so I, I just want to explore how can you use debt wisely and how can you extend credit wisely? Um, this is, <laughs> I don't know if you don't do it, if you, if the answer is yes, but there's a lot of prohibitions in the scriptures about charging interest. Um, that comes up repeatedly in the Old Testament. And I've always just been told, oh, that's the Old Testament, so just don't worry about it, which seems like a pretty weak answer. <laughs> so as we as we go through this topic, I want to help people understand what does the Bible actually say? What is a theology around debt? Love and it. And what, what, what is the thing that God's trying to keep us from when he says all these things in you know, those who lend capital must not demand terms that put the borrower's health or livelihood in jeopardy. Um, if a man is righteous, uh, he does not lend at interest or take any profit. Well, that sounds, that's in Ezekiel. That sounds uh, problematic for those of us who might make a loan uh, and might might even take a loan from, from a friend to do a business project or build a not house. To, not to mention the um, several thousand year history of Jewish financiers. Yes. Well, um, so we're going to get into that. Maybe we'll even, it'd be really fun if I could find myself a rabbi who could explain to me how they get around this. Cause I have, I have studied this a bit in the past few weeks and have s some new insights to share but but it'd be fun to hear somebody who all they have is the the law and so let's see we how you work guys on deal with it yeah okay um one thing i didn't say is for each of these we will we will be providing you if you want to go deep on that one when we cover it we'll be providing you with other episodes where we have covered that topic so all of these things are things we have talked about in some depth or some aspect of them in, in previous episodes or even in blog posts. So um, if you we'll want to make a, people with a suite of knowledge. Yeah. And if you, you might go, I got that one down, but this one I could use some refresher on. We're going to give you the tools you need. It's great. Um, number five, spending. Um, did you know that the ability to spend well, not just budgeting where you don't spend too much, but actually spending well is a 
skill when it comes to money management? I We have tended not to think of it in those terms, but I could certainly see that. I, I can immediately think of friends who spend money well and people who do not spend money well. Yeah. Um, can you share with me what not spending money well is without uh, making your friend look silly? Um, I, I have friends who who's, they make their own lives unnecessarily difficult and they slow themselves down because of their unwillingness to spend money. Yeah. So um, they have to get the cheapest motel at all times, no matter how awkward that is. They, they must buy cheap beater used cars at all. Even if they have the money to buy a nicer car, they, they, there's something in them that says we must make do. I even see this. This is just between us. This is just a little private comment on the side. Um, I, I often think about from the outside, the, the constraints they put on their wives to, I, I, I'm under the impression that like your wife's beauty is a blessing to you and to your family and every, everybody that touches your family, but like putting like harsh constraints on your wife about getting her hair cut or not spending money on makeup or clothes, or you must drive a sorry old car. I always kind of think you, doesn't the scripture say like, if you, if you like, take care of her, you take care of your own body. Didn't I read that somewhere? So I, I, that comes to mind about people who don't spend money well. And you go like, you have money. What are you, why are you sitting on your money? Yeah. And then conversely, of course, part of this is people who uh, spend indiscriminately and they, they don't think, they don't think of the future and they say, Oh, that's ten thousand dollars this month. So, you know, as you're talking, Stephen, I'm just thinking I, our listeners are sharp. They probably don't need me to say this, but just in case, um, there there's a time in life where you might you and your wife might drive the old beater car, and that's yeah. totally fine. Or you might say, "Honey." I am going to work my tail off to get to the point where it's no big deal for you to get a, a hundred dollar haircut once sure. every few months. And um, that's great. But right now we're going to have to stick with fantastic Sam's. Yes, um, of course. So that's, that's a mixed bag. I think Isaiah 55 two is a really cool verse that you, you threw in here. Before yeah. I like this one. It says, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. That's great. So that's just talking. It has nothing to do with money. It's just talking about the spiritual reality of rich preaching of the word, right? I I don't think so. Uh, Let's take it. Let's start with face value. It seems to be talking about spending money on good bread. Well, let's just accept the scriptures as it presents itself. Yeah, I agree. And this verse is probably the most damning of all to those who would purchase things like oat milk, um, <laughs> which is not a milk at all. Yeah, it's, that's not milk and it doesn't satisfy. You, you, no. need the, you need the fat that comes from an animal. That's good for you. Were you, were you, uh, I know you're backed up on volley since you came back from your Israel trip, but did you get to the point where there was discussion about different oat and nut milks? Yes. Yes, I did. And I, I, all I did, I didn't want to get into that. And I don't even listen, all of you volley people, I don't want to get into that now either, but I will say, I just threw a little simple thumbs down emoji on that. Like, (laughs) <laughs> I understand uh, lactose intolerance is a thing. I know that's real, but let's prefer real milk. Agreed. Yeah. Um, it's biblical. Yeah. Uh, so in this one, we'll talk about where should I spend more for quality and where should I buy the cheaper option? Uh, when and how much can I use to treat myself with? So luxury is a part of this. Like you said, uh, you don't have to stay at the dingy hotel every time, but you can also get get a little 
to the point where you realize the luxury needle has gotten stuck in your vein and you are addicted to it. So, um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot to, to talk about here. Some episodes that makes me think about this are we talked about hiring house help. We talked about vacations done better. Those are all spending opportunities. So we'll go through some of that. Yeah. Okay, we got two more until we get to the perfect number of critical financial skills of seven. All right. Number, number six. six. Um, giving, generosity. So Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Um, so mostly what we're going to talk about here is just how if you send money to Abraham's wallet, there will be a blessing that comes your <laughs> way. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, somebody could clip that out and use it against you when you run for office. Uh, that's right. Um, no, I, Steve, what are your thoughts on, on the, the essential nature of the skill of generosity and giving? Well, you'll allow me to answer that uh, question topographically, if I may. So the difference between the health of the Sea of Galilee, which I saw recently, and the death of the Dead Sea is that one has input and output. That would be the Sea of Galilee, where not only does Israel get most of its water supply, much of its water supply from, but most of its fish don't actually come from the Mediterranean. They come from the Sea of Galilee, as opposed to the Dead Sea, which has no output. It only has input. Water comes in, and there it dies. And because, because there's no output, there's no health, uh, there's only death there. There's not a fish that lives in the Dead Sea. There's not a plant that lives in the Dead Sea. And if all of our life is about accepting God's gifts to us, but we don't then turn and start looking like him and do what he does, which is, I want to be a miniature uh, Jesus. So I want to be like him. That's what a Christian is. I mean, your little Christ. I want to do the things that he does. So I receive from him and then I give the way that he does. And if you don't have this healthy flow of your life of giving in a thoughtless, almost careless, generous, I just, I just want to be a blessing out there. Think of this verse, the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. The Lord's just like, I'm just a giver. Just take it. If there's not that muscle in our families that is a it's a habit it's so ingrained in us that it's a character trait of our families. There will be the stench of death on your family. And it could be that you'll die in luxury. It could be that your children will die in worldliness, but there will be the stench of death on your family. We must be generous in all, I would say in all five capitals, but, but having hearts of charity certainly in our finances is an absolute must. Yeah. And we could talk about this one for 10 episodes and we will in days and <laughs> years to come. But, um, I just think there's, even when I'm talking to people who would say, I don't care about your Bible stuff at all. <laughs> and they come up with, this is what we think our family is all about. Um, a lot of the times I will say, have you done much giving or generosity with your money? No, no, we haven't really found anything we'd like to support. Well, I will tell you that for everyone, there is hardly a better vehicle for taking a family vision and culture and stuffing it way deep down inside of a child's heart than through giving. Yeah. So if you say this is the types of things our family's about, you should give, your giving should be towards those types of things, um, whether that's in the church, in your community, to specific people in your lives. Um, giving is just a great vehicle for family vision, uh, indoctrination, and here, here. encouragement. Okay, and lastly, this one is, is near and dear to my heart, um, but inheritance. I know our tagline is run your home and your dough like, like a, a biblical, biblical boss. boss. I'm glad but you know it. If you had to say... Maybe our our next closest 
headline, it's probably something about multi-generational financial and family vision. Like we, we hang out with people who are interested in creating something that lasts for longer than just themselves. Correct. Um, and inheritance is something that the word is used 244 times in the Bible Mm -hmm. in 210 different verses. Um, But we don't really understand it because we think like Americans that says, well, inheritance is the, on average, uh, $46,000 that you get when you're on average 61 years old and your parents die. Um, And that's not at all what the biblical authors meant when they use the word. It's not at all what um, what the Lord had a, has in his heart when he says that we are an inheritance, um, nor is it what he meant when he told Israel that they had an inheritance that they had to go out and claim. So um, Ephesians 1, 11 through 14 says, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. Um, So we have this inheritance. uh, The Holy Spirit is described as the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. We're taking uh, possession of it. And unless we can understand inheritance from a biblical lens, we miss not only the true and good financial principles about how to create lasting inheritance, we also miss a lot of just truth that's in the Bible that this word inheritance is meant to convey to us, but that we've lost because we've we've lost the the biblical understanding of what that word even means. That's great. So um, that's it. That's that's my seven critical skills, and I don't think we're going to lay them on people seven weeks in a row. I think we'll sprinkle these a little bit. Okay, um, but. Um, I hope that these are are all helpful and I do believe that they go sequentially so that um, there's there. The first thing we need to get our hands around is earning. And I don't know, maybe we'll combine one or two uh, to, to get you through them, but not multiplication. Multiplication is going to be its own week. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I can see that. Well, excellent. I can't wait, and we'll we'll uh, jump back into this uh, maybe next week and uh, and get rocking on uh, number one. All right, earning and maybe budgeting depending on how the week of preparation goes. Excellent. Okay, thanks, Mark. We'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Hey, I want to throw a little spotlight on Cleaner Soaps and Sundries. They're a men's personal care brand run by a great guy, CT, who makes cleaner products and does a ton of good for vets along the way. I had tacos with this special ops dude turned entrepreneur in Texas and knew right away this brand is something our listeners are going to love to support. I think you're going to dig the soaps and deodorants and pomades and beard oils, all made from totally natural based ingredients. I use them and I love them. So find all their great stuff at klenr.com. That's cleaner.com. And if you type in AW, you'll get an automatic 10% discount on whatever you find. So check them out.